welcome back to Science Decoded, guys. It's me, your favorite host, Justin Dingman. And today we got a really great paper for you. We're really excited. Dr. William Bain will be my interview subject. And so we've got a great discussion about COVID-19 coming up. But first, I wanted to introduce you guys into some sci-worthy news, really interesting articles on cancer. One talks about how we can create a better algorithm to detect ovarian cancer. And the other one talks about how we can learn about cancer and tumors from naked mole rats. So both of those are recently published. Go onto our website, SciWorthy.com, and go ahead and check those out. We also recently updated our website. So if you guys want to check out some of the new features, some of the new links, and how we're starting to group our articles together. One thing that we've been receiving feedback on throughout this podcast is a lot of people ask us, and even in undergrad, this was a really difficult thing to learn. How do you become a science decoder? How do you kind of take in the science information? How do you digest a paper and how do you move on forward with it? I've decided to try and answer some of those questions at the beginning of some of these episodes. So each episode now, we'll be having new tips and tricks on how you yourself can become a science decoder and get more involved in recent and contemporary science. First and foremost, we have to be able to find the papers and the subjects that interest us. So when trying to find the subjects that interest us, we can use Google Scholar and we can set up alerts for things, keywords, specific fields of interest, or even specific words in the table of contents. And what Google does is they say, oh, within the last week, this many papers have been published with these keywords or in this key subject. And then it sends you the link to all those open access papers so you can start reading it. Another really good website that we like to use is called PubMed. Um, and you can also Google nature, right? And there's a bunch of different nature magazines, nature biology, nature chemistry, nature astronomy. So these are all publishing websites. They're kind of like the URL or, or the Google for science and how we can find some of these open access articles, right? Some services you do have to pay for, but if you continue to Google and dig around in this, you're going to find a lot of open access papers, a lot of papers that are open to the public that we can start reading right away. I'd say the most important thing for you guys is just to figure out what areas of science that you're interested in. Go on to these websites and set up these alerts that will tell you when recent papers within the same field or using the same keywords have published recent results, kind of furthering the nature and the field of that science. The next thing that you're going to want to do is read the abstract of that paper. So for those of you who don't know what the abstract is, abstracts are structured in such a way as to give a brief overview of the article. So what they do is they deliver the main points of the introduction, the methods, the data, the discussion, the conclusion, and sometimes future applications in about eight sentences. So today we're going to be talking about COVID-19 and specifically the images of COVID-19 and how COVID-19 resides in the lungs potentially after infection. So I know there is some heated debate around COVID-19, so I wanted to be able to clarify my sources for this introduction uh, before we get into the actual interview. So my information comes from my own personal background knowledge, and it puts in context the information from a paper by Dr. Kesakella named Features, Evaluation, and Treatment of the Coronavirus. If you want more information, I suggest looking up the science article on the website. Um, one website you can use for science articles of this nature and more moving forward is called the NCBI. And if you just Google NCBI, you can find that website. This is a large database, which we use to look up science papers. So a little bit of background about COVID-19. It's a positive sense RNA virus. This is just a virus whose genetic information is encoded by RNA instead of DNA, which is what codes human genetic information. This change allows for really intriguing aspects of the virus behavior. You know, instead of proteins being made from DNA, which requires a lot of steps and more time, Proteins can be made right from the RNA. This is also very similar to the polio virus. The reason why we care about this so much is because viral proteins are like the subjects of the kingdom, with the RNA being the king of this kingdom. Viral proteins are the ones that go out and do the virus's bidding, and they cause the symptoms of the infection. However, because COVID-19 is an RNA virus, it's also subject to faster evolution and mutation. Since we're going to be talking mainly about what the size, shape, and look of the COVID-19 virus is, it's important to talk about its structure and its shape. So COVID-19 is a coronavirus, which is basically a sphere or an envelope made of, you know, fat, also called lipids, 
with a quote unquote halo of spikes around it. These spikes are made up of sugars and protein. And in science, we call them glycoproteins. And through this shape, it gets its name coronavirus, as the synonym of the word halo is a corona, right? So you have a corona of these sugars and proteins around the envelope, kind of like a crown. And it's through these proteins, the virus interacts with our cells and our cell membranes. Next, it's important to also discuss what our immune response is like to COVID. So many of you guys, I'm sure at this point have heard many of the symptoms you know to watch out for in case you get sick or a family member is sick. But here, I just want to clarify what some of those symptoms are and what they are in the majority of cases and in the minority of cases. So the majority of symptomatic patients commonly present with fever, cough, and shortness of breath. But less commonly, you get a sore throat, the inability to smell, the inability to taste, a loss of appetite, nausea, fatigue, muscle pain, weakness, and diarrhea. One reason behind all of this is these are very similar symptoms of a viral infection, right? The fever, the cough, the shortness of breath, that's all our body's response to trying to destroy this virus, right? And then when you get into these less common symptoms like sore throat and inability to smell and inability to taste, those are unique aspects of the virus and how it's interacting with your body and the cells in your body. However, there's one thing we have to note about our immune response to viruses, immune responses can actually potentially cause damage. Immune systems have these special cells called myeloid cells, which are part of our very first immune response. So our body is exposed for the first time to something it doesn't like, and our body uses these myeloid cells to help control and and get rid of the bad things that are trying to get in our body. This is called our innate immunity. These myeloid cells intake the virus. And when a myeloid cell intakes a foreign body or intakes a virus, this causes inflammation in our body. And inflammation can actually cause a lot of damage. It produces a lot of reactive oxygen species, a lot of molecules called cytokines. And these things can cause very interesting effects, both in our cardiovascular system. So so it really does kind of mess up the body when you have an inflammation process. So even though our body is protecting us through this immune response, there is actually some damage. There is some something, some debt we have to pay in order to protect ourselves up front through this innate immunity. So with all that being said, today we're going to be talking to Dr. William Bain about his recent paper, Lower Respiratory Tract Myeloid Cells Harbor SARS-CoV-2 and Display an Inflammatory Phenotype. Well, welcome back, Science Decoders. Today, we're going to be talking about the COVID virus and how it appears in the lungs. And today, we have with us uh, Dr. William Bain. Uh, Dr. Bain, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how you got into medicine and what your research is about? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Justin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so so I'm a doctor, and um, I am a lung and ICU specialist. And so that means that when you come to an ICU, frequently there's someone that's a specialist to take care of patients that are that sick that they might need a ventilator or that sort of thing. And and so I'm, I'm one of those doctors. And in addition to practicing medicine, I also do research. And so my research is related to pneumonias and how the human body and how mice um, are able to fight off pneumonia and, and survive it because... Our goal is to figure out how that works so that we can do it to, um, uh, so we can use that to help patients get better. So those are the big picture of, uh, of why I was here, uh, you know, who I am and why I was, uh, ended up doing this research is because, you know, when COVID became uh, an all-encompassing um, uh, topic, you know, certainly we were looking at that even before it came to the United States. And so... Mm-hmm. And when it did come, one of the things we wanted to figure out is how we could contribute. And so I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh and we, we were lucky. We didn't have a huge COVID surge back in the spring. Uh, The article we're going to talk about today mostly came from that, that spring surge. Awesome. And the time, yeah, it's great information on the timing of that study as well. So what would you say was the main aim of this study? What was the question you guys were trying to answer? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think and one of the things that makes our um, study a little different than many of them is that we took samples from the lung because the lung is where the virus enters and does most of its damage. So 
um, we really felt strongly that we needed to see what was happening in the lung itself. Um, we do this all the time ourselves is use blood, right? It's, it's, it's easy to get, um, whereas the samples that we collected, patients had to be on a ventilator, had to be so sick that they're on a ventilator in order for us to get these samples. There's the adage or whatever that, that there's the drunk guy looking under the street light for his keys and they say, mm-hmm. well, why are you looking there? And he's like, well, that's where the light is. Um, <laughs> and so to me, that's somewhat what um, looking in the blood can can lead to is, well, that's that's where the light is, but that's not really necessarily where the virus is doing most of its damage. So we wanted to look what uh, at what was happening in the lung. And the research that we do is primarily, so there's, there's two arms of the immune system there's the, the trainable arm, which is called the, the quote unquote adaptive immune system. So that's the things that that are in the news a lot these days about antibodies and B cells and T cells. And, and, and these are specialized cells that help learn about uh, invading pathogens and then sort of develop a, uh, a repertoire to fight them. The other arm of immunity is called innate, meaning inborn. So these are are untrained immune cells. They they rush into areas of um, of infection um, or inflammation and help sort of try to get rid of invaders. Um, but they they don't necessarily remember. Um, so they're they're a little bit more untrained. And we look at those untrained cells as sort of our area of expertise. And just because they're you know they have less training than the uh, adaptive immune system that the train cells, it, it's, they're still quite important because we know that if patients don't have one of the cells we talk about in the paper is, a, uh, is something called a neutrophil. And so it, we know that patients that because of genetic disorders uh, or other issues don't have neutrophils, that can happen during cancer treatment, for example. We know that those patients are really, really uh, at high risk of many sorts of infections. So even though they're untrained, we think that it, it's really important to look at. So some of the data that was out there had suggested that these untrained, quote unquote, innate immune cells um, that got into the lung were causing harm. And so we wanted to look at a couple um, specific types of those to see, well, you know, how are those cells interacting with the virus and Mm -hmm. what does that mean? And we had no idea what we were going to find. You know, honestly, at the time it was uh, dealing with this the, this material was almost like uh, cleaning up nuclear waste. It was hard hard to find people willing to uh, uh, to to touch it or process it um, like we did. So it was um, uh, uh, it was it was difficult. And the the aim was to to look in the lung and to try to find out what these immune innate immune cells are doing and try to see if we could find anything. So you know the human body is a very complex sample matrix, and even so is lung tissue and lung samples. So how did you guys control for any other factors in your um, experiments and in your observations to make sure that the trends you were seeing were true to what you prescribed them? Yeah, and, and Justin, I think that's a, an excellent point uh, about the, uh, the complexity of the, of the human body, because, um, you know, even, even compared to the spring, you know, the, the virus that is circulating now uh, compared to a year ago is, is different and our treatments are different. So it's, it's always a moving target in, in biology. But in, in, in controlling for those sorts of variables is very important in science. And some of the things that we did um, to control for some of that is that we tried to process all the samples exactly the same way. Because anytime you, you process something, you, can, you run the risk of creating issues or um, making what we call artifact, meaning mm. um, changes that are not real but are induced by the, the processing itself. Um, so, so we were very uh, strict about that. So it was myself and um, uh, one or two other people that processed all the samples um, to, to try to eliminate that variable. In addition to processing, that includes, um, I should mention, collection. So we tried to collect it in, in, a, in a similar fashion as we can. And so how we did that is we would don all our protective gear. We would um, go into the, uh, the intensive care unit rooms. Even before this, uh, and so, sorry, taking a step back, even before we would go into the room, we would get consent from patient families. And um, I, I want to mention that the patients and their families that allowed us to collect these samples, I mean, we are so grateful because, mm. uh, you know, it's a, it's a true gift to science, which means it's a gift to, to, to all of us, to all of humanity, because uh, it allows us to learn. And so 
these, you know, the, the patients were quite sick. And so we're going in and we're, we're spraying a little bit of salt water down their breathing tube, which is the, um, it's how we clean breathing tubes on a daily basis. So it's not high risk, but the, the patients were sick and you, and you just never know. Uh, so we would put a little salt water in and then, uh, and then suck that back out and then take that sample for processing. Um, mm. So the, the collection and processing were done in a very regimented way. And then after that, for trying to control for um, other forms of error in the process, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. Some of the, uh, what we tried to show is try to show that the end result, our conclusion in multiple different ways. So one of the things we did was we looked at the, the samples under the microscope just in general. Hey, do what we, is what we're seeing the same as what other people are seeing when they look under the microscope or, mm, or the mm-hmm. it was. And then we looked at, well, we looked at it with the, um, the electron microscope, um, which is a, a way to really look down as, as at, at, at a subcellular level. I mean, you can, you, you can't see, uh, proteins, but you can see sort of clumps of protein like a virus. Um, uh, and then so then we said, OK, we saw it that way. Well, then we need to prove it another way. And that's why we did antibody tagging with the electron microscopy. And then we did antibody mm-hmm. tagging with fluorescent pictures called immunofluorescence. So so we, we tried to um, uh, look at it a bunch of different ways. And and that's uh, one approach to science that, that I like is is if you can show something four different ways, well, then it's it's probably pretty accurate. No, that's definitely a method that we've been taught in grad school as well. You know, some some head researchers, some PIs really like to focus on that way of presenting their articles. And, you know, it takes a little bit longer to get papers out that way, but I think it's overall very convincing work. Yes, you yes. <laughs> um, it is uh, more uh, more the the principal investigator, the head of the totem pole has the time and the yeah. prestige to say, well, we got to do it four ways where is when you're, you're a little bit further down the totem pole, like you, yourself or myself, it's sort of like, gosh, I really want to get this thing out. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, you know, one of the key methods you just talked about was your immunofluorescence assay. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, as I, I mentioned earlier with the trained immune system, that that adaptive immune system. So one of the things that it turns out uh, or churns out and many people listening to this have probably heard of these uh, uh, is antibodies, right? And so antibodies are a miracle of biology and they, they're, they're proteins that are, they're churned out by a, a, a specialized cell. And what they do is, is that they bind to a, a protein that they were trained to bind against. And then they bind very tightly. It's very difficult to get them off. And so as the understanding about that grew within science, people uh, much smarter than me came up with the idea, well, we can put something on the, the back side of the antibody, not the side because they're, they're sort of, they look like a Y. And so not at the Y part that attaches to the protein, it's on the, the tail, the bottom of the Y. And there's different things you can put there. And so in this case, if you put a fluorescent dye, then what, whatever that protein that antibody is directed to, when it attaches, it'll it'll bind tightly, and then that will be fluorescent. So then under the microscope, you can look at where different proteins are. And so in our case, we took this, this it's basically spit or mucus out of patients' breathing tubes. We slammed it onto a slide and then did some processing amidst this sea of, of spit and mucus. We found these cells. And then We wanted to see what type of cells those were. And so these antibodies of interest attached onto those cells, which told us that, oh, these cells are inflammatory because these antibodies are attaching. And then we looked and saw, okay, well, the virus is also there because the antibody against the virus is also attaching to these cells. So then that told us that these untrained immune cells, the myeloid cells, these untrained cells that rush into the lung and we think cause part of the problem, it turns out that a lot of those cells were also eating up virus because under the microscope, they have the antibodies were attaching to these cells with virus. They were attaching to the virus in the cell, and they're also attaching um, to these other markers that tell us that these are these uh, inflammatory cells. What our conclusion was, these untrained cells, when they're eating up virus or, or, or taking up virus, they're then becoming inflammatory based on that. Interesting. So what sort of clinical applications do you think that this holds? The global effort 
to understand this virus and how the body fights it has been really amazing. And I, I haven't seen anything like it in my sh- sort of somewhat shorter time in, in medicine and research compared to other people. But I mean, really, pretty much every doctor and researcher in the world was sort of trying to figure out how this virus is hurting people and what we can do to, to fight it. And it's been, it's been really unprecedented. So, um, you know, for example, I, I, uh, my funding, my research funding comes from the, the VA. You know, the VA has done a lot of research, you know, clinical trials, basic research to try to, to, try to understand this. But also I want to give a lot of credit to everybody that pays taxes, for example, mm-hmm. that then goes on to support all this amazing science. Uh, so it's, it's, been a, it's just been a really tremendous global effort. But a year ago, there was sort of a debate. Uh, some people said the reason that the virus is causing all this problems is because it's making um, people too inflamed. They called it a, a quote unquote cytokine storm. That sort of means an inflammatory uh, storm in the body that just sort of cre- created all this inflammation that uh, caused all these problems. And then another group of people said, well, no, it's the virus that's causing the problem. So we need to figure out how to to fight the virus. And I think in the end, it turns out that both, both camps were right um, because If patients don't have uh, intact immune systems, they don't do well, but also some healthy people for reasons that we, that I I think still need to be characterized, still have problems with the virus. And there was a a trial that people probably heard about that was conducted in England, and then it's been replicated in other places. And what they showed is steroids, not, not like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, (laughs) uh, get huge steroids, but uh, what are called corticosteroids, which are naturally occurring steroids. And they're commonly used in medicine, especially in the hospital, uh, patients with inflammatory diseases, et cetera. So steroids are are cheap, used all the time, and they're they're Mm -hmm. well studied. So basically, it came as a surprise to a lot of people that because this is a virus, you get um, then then steroids, which sort of tamp down inflammation, actually help people survive. Um, and so, as we were processing our data, well, that's one way to, to to sort of understand this because you need an it's sort of a Goldilocks. You need enough ability to fight the virus that the virus doesn't overwhelm the body, but you mm-hmm. don't want too strong of an immune response. Um, because that can cause problems it, it itself. So, you know, things like uh, steroids that bring down the inflammation, it may be, you know, one speculation is, is that it may be that these types of cells are becoming too inflammatory when they take up the virus. So uh, it could explain why why steroids are beneficial, be, given that, I mean, I for one was surprised by that that finding. So, mm-hmm. um so that that's that's one possible explanation, but there's there's uh, a lot of work that would need, need to be done to to really truly understand that. But it's that's one speculation. Well, on this podcast too, we have our first ever reader question. So we had a reader or a listener write in, and it was pretty applicable to the COVID discussion and everything. So you you talked about using IEM and electron microscopy as your main tool. Can you explain the trade-offs and the differences between IEM, TEM is transmission electron microscopy, um, using molecular detection and culturing to all kind of measure a virus and what that applies to? Yeah, that's that's a that's a very astute question. It's a that's 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 awesome. So we were very lucky to partner with the Dr. Pamela Bjorkman. Um, she is one of the most you know the preeminent virologists in the in the world. And so, in one of the ways that she studies viruses is using electron microscopy. And so, one of the people in her lab, a guy by the name of Mark Ledensky, who is just a tremendous, tremendously skilled microscopist and also just a, a lovely person to work with. Um, so. So we were very lucky to work with them. What they use is what's called electron tomography. And so this is a mm. form of, and it's a form of transmission electron microscopy, where instead of looking at just a single cut of a, you know, like a cell block or that sort of thing, like, so when we would send these pellets, they would cut through them, but they, they arrange it so that they're actually able to take multiple slices. So they actually can make movies of this and sort of show the virus and other aspects of the cell as you go up and down through the, the plane. So, you know, that, that is really, uh, really impressive. And the work that they did was amazing. And so how did they, how do we know 
what those look like. So they, they cultured the virus in cells and then and imaged that. Um, and they took, uh, I believe, uh, other specimens. So they sort of trained on to see what those viruses look like. And they're experts in HIV, hepatitis C, other viruses. So again, this is one of the best labs for the study of viruses in the world. And so they had very they were very confident that these were viruses. But to prove it, uh, and again, sort of what you and I talked about earlier, Justin, is sort of you want to pr- you want to show it in multiple different ways. Mm-hmm. So then, so then we add on immuno electron microscopy, as we were talking about earlier, where um, there's the immunofluorescence. Same idea. The antibodies are directed against a specific protein. In this case, one of the virus proteins and one of the one of the body's proteins, and then it is attached to. Uh, a different size particle that is gold. So you can see it really well uh, on the electron mi- microscope. And so this was done at um, here at Pitt um, by Dr. Donna Stoltz in our uh, Center for Biologic Imaging. And so what she showed is that these cells, so she marked the cells and showed under the electron microscope that they were that they were host cells and they were myeloid cells that, that are referenced. And then she also showed that there's lots of virus in these cells because the antibody that was directed against those virus was all throughout the cell as well. Um, so that was sort of a, a way to, to prove it. And then we've also worked with the, the Bjorkman lab on some other projects that have, that have subsequently been published. And so there was a, a, an immune suppressed patient here at Pittsburgh. He had had a chemotherapy and then a procedure that made it so that he had a really hard time to get his um, adaptive immune response going. Unfortunately, over the course of a couple months, he developed a lot of viral complications and the virus kept growing and mutating in, in his body. We were able to collect some of that spit and mucus from his breathing tube. And so the Bjorkman lab looked at that with the electron microscope and showed it looked exactly like what we had shown, but uh, there was just a lot more of it, you know, whereas we would just find a couple of viruses and, uh, or excuse me, virions and those more healthy people, this patient that um, was immune suppressed had just tons and tons and tons of virions. And so we also cultured that spit here at the, at Pittsburgh, someone named Paul Dupre, who's the, uh, head of the Center for Vaccine Research. He's kind of a a superstar. He's been on like Trevor Noah and John Oliver and that sort of thing. But anyways, with his lab, they took that mucus and um, cultured it. So, you know, we sort of have, uh, you know, four or five different ways of showing that these things that, that we are seeing are virus. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one question that my editor had was that, is this the first paper to ever use IEM to detect SARS-CoV-2? Or were there others before you guys whose work you maybe piggybacked off of or or knew of? Uh, That's a good question. I think that I I don't think we were the, the first. I think we were one of the first to show to show this in samples from living patients or patients that survived because much of the the work that is done is is in autopsies but then you kind of never know you know does that is that happening in patients that are healthy right mm-hmm. so others had shown that so i think at the time and and it's always hard to know because the volume of research is is so large but we think we were one of the first to show it in samples from patients that then survived in the lungs a, a group out of northwestern that used different approaches um, so so i don't have a good answer for whether we were the first to use uh, immuno em but i i believe we were the first to use it in in COVID with um, lung samples from living folks. Cool. There's one last question I like to ask at the end of every podcast. So why'd you come on today? And is there anything else, you know, you kind of want to tell our listeners? Yeah, yeah. And and, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And um, I hope this has uh, been worth <laughs> people's uh, time listening. Um, but I, I, the reason I came on is because I think science is important as I, I, I kind of you know, mentioned earlier, and I'm a true believer in this, that, that, you know, there's a a lot of people in science that work really hard to try to understand this. There's a lot we get out of it, right? There's um, fascination and the thrill of discovery and and many things along that way. It is also a a, a global effort. We're all chipping in um, some of our money and taxes, and then that's going off. And then that is being used to to spin off, uh, you know, this amazing... Uh, amount of research. Uh, so, you know, one year ago, the virus was raging here. And now 
people are starting to take off their masks, right? Because mm-hmm. people are vaccinated. And, and that is really um, collective effort that goes into that because there's people that pay their taxes or donate to charities and foundations that support it. And then there's uh, people that during this most vulnerable time in the hospital, give their, their samples, uh, you know, samples from, mm-hmm. from them you know, uh, 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 to do it. And then there's a lot of researchers that are, that are working on this. So it's really um, just a, an, an amazing community effort. And so I, I was in the military before I became a doctor. And, and I think that, and I served in, in, in Iraq. And to me, this has been the most, uh, you know, inspirational time. I mean, it's been, mm-hmm. it's, it's been tough, but it's also been amazing to be part of this sort of effort to fight this common enemy that is this, uh, that is this virus. And mm-hmm. uh, so I'm just uh, very grateful to everyone for their support in that. And I hope that this has been um, helpful to understand some of the, uh, what we do on a daily basis to try to unlock the mystery and unwind it and understand it so we can make people's lives better. Absolutely. Well, that's all we have today at Science Decoded. We want to just thank Dr. William Bain um, and his awesome work with some really cool pictures about what the COVID virus actually looks like and how we know what it looks like and some of the things that we can start to gather and determine post-pandemic about how the coronavirus might have lasting impacts and um, long-lasting health effects as well. If you guys are interested in any other science articles or any other science subjects, we really encourage you to go on to SciWorthy.com and go ahead and search through our categories. We've got a ton of papers by a ton of great writers. You might find a subject you end up loving or a subject that you're extremely passionate about. And potentially those keywords or that subject can be the center or the focus of your further exploration into science and, and what's going on. We would just like to take a second and say thank you uh, to all of our listeners and the wonderful support that we've had. If you could like, share, subscribe, rate, whatever, tweet, retweet, snap face, book it, gram, whatever, we would love your support. We absolutely love the social media presence that we've been getting, and we want to be able to continue that so that everybody can have access to easy, understandable science information that impacts their day-to-day lives and that's going to impact their future, whether it's their health, their economy, the technology that's available at their desk, their job, or even inspire you to potentially change fields or pursue a question that you didn't know was being asked and you want to know the answer to. Hi, Gina here. Thanks for listening to Science Decoded. We want to thank our host with the most, Justin Dingman, as well as our behind-the-scenes team members, Osama Alien and Garrett Campion. Our channel artwork was designed by Tammy Whitsons, and our theme song was written and recorded by Graham Albright. We'd also like to thank our Patreon and local supporters. Without all of you, we couldn't do what we do. SciWorthy is an initiative of the 501c3 nonprofit Blue Marble Space. You can learn more at www.bluemarblespace.org.